it as much as you have done it unto the least of these, my little ones, you have done it unto me. That needs to be the guiding principle in the way that we live our lives and the way that we treat those around us. If we look back over our lives and consider every instance and we ask ourselves and we examine ourselves, because this is not something for others to examine us in. This is something that we must do within ourselves. In every situation, with everyone that you have encountered in your life, if you stop and pose the question in that situation, is this how I would have treated Jesus? What would your answer be? Well, the simple truth of the matter is, regardless of whether we would have said, yes, this is what I would have done if it had been Jesus, or no, I wouldn't have done it that way if it had been Jesus. The simple truth is, that is exactly the way that we treated Jesus. That is exactly the way that we behave towards our Lord and Savior. <clears throat> In as much as ye have done it, whether good or ill, right or wrong, kind or cross, in as much as ye have done it, to one of these, my little ones, you have done it unto me. And before you pose the question, well, what if it wasn't one of his little ones? My answer to you is this. You don't know. You don't have the ability to know. You don't have the power to know. You don't have any reason to know. And since you don't know, isn't it far better to treat everyone you meet with the assumption that this is one of his little ones? And we go beyond that. You say, well, they don't go to church with me, or they don't go to church, or they don't this, they don't that, they don't something else. I remind you again that the Apostle Paul gave us this instruction. Do good to all men. Now, he made this concession, especially they of the household of faith. He recognized that there is a special affection to those that love the Lord and manifest that love. There is a special drawing and a special affection there that, that we recognize, and, and, and I certainly am not going to deny it. As a matter of fact, I'm very thankful for it. But that does not negate the first part of that instruction. Do good to all men. Do good to those that do good to you. Do good to those that treat you bad. Do good to those that speak kindly to you. And do good to those that talk to you like you're a dog. Of course, as a matter of fact, in this day and time, for, for most people, if you talk to, like most folks talk to their dogs, while well, well, you're being treated pretty kindly, at least you wouldn't be around my house. <clears throat> Treat everybody like you would treat. And understand that our Lord 
of Jesus covered every age group. There, there, I'm sure there, there are myriad reasons why that, that he came into this world in the fashion of a baby and grew into adulthood and suffered the things that he suffered. But one of those, to, to my heart and mind, has always been this, that there is no one you will ever encounter from the suckling babe to the orneriest teen to the wisest adult that you will ever encounter that your Lord Jesus has not experienced that age as a man. So we are without excuse to treat ill any one. And now before you get, you know, I know that there are some people that by their behavior, maybe, maybe they deserve to be, maybe, maybe by man's logic and reasoning, they deserve to be treated a little short. You know, I don't have time for you. I don't have time for this nonsense. I don't have time for your foolishness. I don't have time for you being ugly. <coughs> but sometimes, just being kind is all it takes to undo the ugliness that another person is experiencing because again, and, and I know these things should be plain and, 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 and people have turned them into little catchy phrases and everything but the simple truth is you don't know what that person is going through. You don't know what tragedy or what trial or what tribulation they may be dealing with in their life. And while we would like to say, well, I, I, you know, even if you do know, well, if it was me, I wouldn't act that way. Well, it's not you, and until it is you, you can't say exactly how you're going to act. You can talk about how you hope you'll act, how you'd like to act, how you'd like to behave, how you think you'd react, but until it happens to you, you don't know. And you say, well, what's this got to do with Christmas? Well, actually, it's got everything to do with the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's what Christmas is about. It's about how we treat the people around us. Not just in December, but every day, how we live our lives. You see, he was born a Savior. He came this, into this world a Savior. He left this world a Savior. He was a Savior before he got here, and he's been a Savior ever since he left here. He has not changed. Our concept of him, the way that we see him, may have changed, may have matured, may have become clearer, but that did not change him. And his worthiness to be honored and glorified in our lives and nothing honors and glorifies him more than treating his children like we would treat him. Always a good lesson. Now, that being said, turn for just a few moments, if you will, to the first chapter of the book of Matthew. more directly, the gospel of Jesus Christ is recorded by Matthew. And in the 18th verse, familiar story, he says, now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. This is what happened 
This is the way that Jesus came into the world. That's why he's saying the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. Now, I'm sure that we all understand that, that Matthew had to have penned these words with a measure of understanding by the grace of God and according to the Spirit of God. We understand that. But sometimes we fail to stop and also to consider Matthew knew the man Jesus. Matthew, in all likelihood, knew Mary and Joseph. Matthew, by being acquainted with Jesus, would have, in all likelihood, been acquainted with the family. It was, it was a first-hand account that he was relating. Yes, through faith and revelation, but also through a, 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 an intimate knowledge, if you will, of the family and the things that took place there. We sometimes fail to realize that, that these men, Jesus called these men his friends. You stop and think about your friends. We're blessed to have close friends. We've got a few that, that pretty much know the whole story of our life, don't they? We've shared with them stories of our youth and stories that have been told to us of our young days and 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 we, we, have, we, we, we lose sight sometimes of the fact that these men, yes, they were, they were called of God, called to be apostles, called to be ministers. They, it, it was a miraculous thing that took place in their lives, and yet at the same time, they were men. And they experienced the same things that we as men experience today. So Matthew was relating here something that was that was very personal to him. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was espoused, betrothed, engaged. We don't, we don't use that word espoused much anymore. When as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, before their official wedding, because you understand when, when, when a, a, a couple were, were wed back in that day, there, was, there wasn't a, a ceremony like we think of it today. They, they literally, they, they dressed in their, in their finery, they, 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 they marched through town, People that family and friends were lying along the way, cheering and encouraging them. There was a feast, and then this was consummated by the groom taking the bride into his mother's tent and, and consummating the marriage. When as his mother Mary was a spouse of Joseph, before they came together, Joseph had never known Mary in any type of intimate relationship other than the love that had been placed in his heart for her. She was found with child of the Holy Ghost. That's a miraculous thing to say the least. That she was caused by God to conceive through the Holy Spirit this blessed child Jesus, whose blood was not of his, was not of Adam, but was of his father God. It was not tainted with sin. He was not touched with man's corruption. Were it not by the grace and the mercy of God, We'd all shake our heads at this and say there's no way, right? We've got some fairly educated people in here, folks that have attended school, some that have attended college, uh, some that, that, that have 
pursued medicine in one form or another, and, and, and everything that we've ever learned about human reproduction says that this is not possible. And in spite of that, what does your heart tell you? What does your soul tell you? What does the anchor of God's truth tell you in your heart? That God is perfectly capable of performing with and in and among men those things that are by men deemed impossible. There's no doubt in my heart, even when at times my mind says it just can't be, there is no doubt in my heart that this word is true, that this word is pure, that before she was ever touched by man, she was touched by God, and that, and from that touch, she was found with the child of the Holy Ghost. But now, put yourself in Joseph's shoes for a moment. Remember, this is, this is all pertaining to the birth of Jesus. Put yourself in Joseph's shoes for just a minute. Would you believe? Joseph was in love with this little woman. He was looking forward to, to, to making a life with her, to spending his life with her. And here all of a sudden, she's pregnant. She's going to have a baby. And he's never laid a hand on her. He's never been with her. And she's going to have a baby. And Joseph's mind ran just like most of the rest of us would. Except that he was kind of, Now, I, I, I'm amazed sometimes in, in, in a time that was governed by strict law at the kindness of Joseph's heart. Joseph was, was he, he knew the legalities. And he apparently thought in his mind, well, I can't marry her. But I don't want folks looking down on her. I don't want people thinking bad of her. I love her. I can't marry her, but, but, but I'll put her away privately. I'll, I'll, I'll do it in such a way that, that nobody will know the reason why, that nobody will understand what was going on. I'll do it in a way that will do her the very least harm possible. What a kind and what, what a great evidence of the love that Joseph had for Mary. And how wonderful is our God. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David. <clears throat> and if you go back just a few verses, you can read the genealogy, and you will find that Joseph was literally a son of David. Just keep in mind, no, he wasn't, he wasn't, David was not his immediate father in the terms that we think of father. But in that day and time, if you were of the lineage of someone, you were a son of that person. He was a son of, the, his lineage could be checked, traced back to King David. In another place, if you go and read it, I, I don't remember which one of the genealogies it is now, but rather than chasing, tracing the genealogy through Joseph's side, it traces it through Mary's side, and it still goes back to David, but not through Solomon. It goes back through one of the, one of, uh, one of the other sons. But from both a, a what we would consider a human standpoint and from a legal standpoint, but as because the legality of that was important to the Jews in that day and time, the lineage was always followed through the sons. 
And, and from, from a legal standpoint as well as a human standpoint, God's word was made manifest to be true that Jesus was of the tribe of Judah. That he was of the lineage of David that he had the right and the authority to occupy David's throne. Behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Now there's an important lesson for us here. Have you ever been faced with something that, that from a legal standpoint you've been told all of your life wasn't possible? Or that you shouldn't take any part in? Something that, that, that you were told, you know, that you shouldn't, you shouldn't have anything to do with that situation or maybe you shouldn't have anything to do with that person or that there was all kinds of legal restrictions around you for something and yet you felt the Spirit of God bidding you to follow His will. Not that I'm any kind of a perfect example at all, and I don't mean it that way, but just to, to show you that, that, that God's word and God's will and God's power is still true. From a legal standpoint, I could not be here preaching to you. The legality that I was raised up under said, you folks are out of order. The legality that I was raised up under said that uh, that that. My, my spiritual life, my, my church life was forfeit for me to even consider such a thing. It's tragic that it's that way. But it is that way. But I've learned through the years that it's better to obey God than to obey men. And I know that God has put me where I am for purposes mostly known to Him. And I'm thankful. I thank God for His mercy in my life, for His leadership, for the direction of His Spirit, and for the for his continued blessing upon us together in our endeavor to serve him. I'm sure that there are many of you that have been faced with situations in your life that, that from whatever legality you were guided by, whether it was the rule of your parents or, 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 or the rule of the society you grew up in or the culture that you were at, whatever it was, that, that, that the legality said that, that these things... You couldn't engage in certain things or engage with certain people or have compassion for or feel kind towards certain people. And yet the Spirit of God made you to do that which was not convenient for your legality. Fear not. Child of God, when the Spirit of God leads you, fear not. When others around you might make fun of you, misunderstand you, talk bad about you, tell other people what kind of a fool you are, Do you suppose that at some point in time word probably got out in the community that, that, that Mary was actually pregnant before she was ever with Joseph? More than likely that word got out, didn't it? You know, that, that sort of thing has, has a tendency to, 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 to be made known sooner or later. And don't you reckon that there were probably people that whenever Joseph walked by they'd just shake their head and well, that goes Mary's fool. But that doesn't change what God bids us to do. That doesn't change 
the grace and the mercy of God in our lives that gives us the courage to not be afraid of what men are going to think or what men are going to whisper behind their back or what men might come and stand and say in their face. Fear not. Listen to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And remember that as much as you see, again, this is this this is, is, is what needs to guide our reaction. As much as you've done it unto one of these, the least of my little ones, you've done it unto me. David, don't be uh, uh, Joseph, don't be afraid. That which is conceived in Mary is of the Holy Ghost. And now you see he receives another promise. There is no question but what that which was conceived in her was going to come forth. There was never, she, there was never any danger of him being stillborn or of her having a miscarriage because this was the word of God. She shall bring forth a son. There was no escaping that fact. There was no getting around that truth. There was nothing that was going to happen to her or to that child that would prevent him from being born into the world. She shall bring forth a son. And thou shalt call his name Jesus. He is certainly going to be born and you are assuredly and certainly going to call him by the name Jesus. Which literally means Savior. Thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save. Not he's going to do his best. Not he's going to try. Not if, as long as you stay on board with this thing, Joseph, and help him out, and and and, and you know, do 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 whatever he whatever he commands of you. He shall save his people. He's not going to try. He's not going to do his best. He's not going to, which he did do his best, and his best was more than sufficient. But the point is, you know, most times we say, somebody say, well, I need you to do so and so. Well, I'll do my best. Well, what that means is I'm telling you, I might not get it done, or I might not get it done just like you want it, but I'll, I'll, I'll give it my best shot. Sometimes that best isn't good enough, is it? See, Jesus wasn't just trying to do something. He came to do the will of his Father. He shall save his people from their sins. She shall bring forth a son. You shall call his name Jesus. And he shall save his people from their sins. You see, this was all about him. It wasn't about Joseph. It wasn't about Mary. It wasn't about us. It wasn't about anybody trying to do anything or, or needing to help with anything. This was a positive declaration from the throne of God as to who this child was and to what exactly this child was going to accomplish. And I'm thankful to stand here and tell you this morning that as sure as we're breathing, he did not fail. And he will not fail. Now all this was done. It didn't just happen. There was a reason. All this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophecy. The Lord had already told them. He had already sent them his word. 
And all this was done that they might see and know that his word is truth. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call him Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. God <coughs> with us. Now, where is Jesus today? Yes, he was born a babe. He was wrapped in swaddling claws. He was laid in a manger. He grew to adulthood. He was crucified. He was laid in a borrowed tomb. He arose from that tomb. He ascended back unto the Father. But where did he promise us that he would be? I and my Father will come and take up our abode in your heart. We are sure that he is our Savior because we are well and personally acquainted. Child of God, stop and think about it. We, we, we rush past these things so many times in our lives. We, 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 we see people all the time that talk about, you know, how much they, they, they wish that they had spent more time with their parents or they had spent more time with their children or because we, we let life gets hold of us and things rush by us and time gets away from us and we think we've got all the time in the world and the first thing you know we're out of time. But when was the last time that you stopped and sat down and quietly considered for a few moments where your Savior dwells. That he doesn't live in some far off land, but that he is aware of your every breath, your every heartbeat, your every desire, and your every fear. And that he is your Savior. Now, I don't need saving from my sins anymore. He did that on Calvary. And he did it once for all. But I get up every day needing a Savior. I get up every day needing one that will walk close enough with me that he will deliver me from my old frailties, that he will deliver me from my fears, that he will deliver me from my doubts, that he will deliver me from my out of nature and bless me to treat every man, every woman, every child that I come in contact. like I would do it if it were him. I know us is born a Savior, which is Jesus Christ the Lord. Now for some of us, that truth was made manifest many, many years ago. As I said the other day, somewhere in the world right now, God has children who far, who even in this moment, for the first time in their life, it has been revealed to them that there is a Savior born unto them, which is Jesus Christ the Lord. And it fills their hearts and souls with joy, and it ought to fill us with joy for them. The knowledge that He is still revealing Himself to His people should fill us with joy and compassion and thanksgiving. May God bless you. May God bless us all together. To have the heart to 
Jackson, Georgia, the world in July. To worship in March, this same one for whom we sing Silent Night, Holy Night. May we not forget in January that there is a Savior born unto us. And may we live every day in the light of that knowledge to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. May God bless and keep you.